Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming out this morning for Coffee with a Curator. Um, if you were here last month, it was also extremely crowded. Uh, we are very pleased to have solved, at least for today, a very simple solution by being able to broadcast into the next room. We are even more happy to be able to announce that by the next Coffee with a Curator, we will have a completely new AV system, so it will just be always done this way. We will always have overflow into the theater, so if you come back, if it's very crowded, no problem, we have comfortable seats for you. Come a little earlier so you can have some coffee before the talk, but um, we will be able to accommodate 200 people, I guess, so that's pretty nice. And it's pretty amazing that we have more than 100 people coming for these to begin with, so we are very pleased and thank you. Um, couple quick announcements before we start the talk today. Uh, first off, we want to thank Cafe Gala who provide the uh, refreshments for the morning and uh, definitely they are supplying us all with a lot of caffeine which is always helpful so that's huge. Uh, second, just a quick announcement. If you're a member, we actually have a very unusual members trip to, um, to Orlando this weekend. We are going just basically for an 11 o'clock Saturday through the morning of Sunday. Um, it is a trip to basically go over, get a tour of uh, the Dolphin Hotel, uh, meet uh, two Disney-related animators, and kind of get a preview of what we're talking about for the, the show coming up in January. So if that sounds interesting, Jody Morelli up here in the very front right side would be very happy to talk to you about the trip afterwards. So um, she is available. And now just a couple of uh, events that we have coming up. Uh, first thing is that we have our... Um, uh, Psy Cafe coming up on the 17th of this month and we're taking advantage of the opening of Star Wars and it's going to be I think I think the title of it is Episode 7 Wormholes to Warp Drives so if that sounds intriguing that is a free event uh, you just have to RSVP for it we also are doing a collaboration on the 20th with um, which is a Friday night with a uh, studio at 620 we have a performer named uh, Ha Man who is a cellist he works with a vocalist and, um, and another musician. They will be improvising. It will be very extraordinary. They do sort of a, a classical approach on improvisation, so that should be a lot of fun. And then the next morning, on the 21st, which is a Saturday morning, we're collaborating with the Florida Orchestra on an event for children. So if you have young children, uh, we did this last year, last May. It was an incredible program, wonderful opportunity for them to be exposed to chamber music and to hear a great story. Um, and then related to actually what we're talking about today, in De on December 4th, which is the first Friday of December, we have uh, Paul Theros, who is the gentleman who collected and put together the Escher exhibition that we have upstairs. That was his private collection before it went to the Heraclitum Museum. He's going to be here to speak that evening. So we will have a lot of information available. And then the final two announcements we have for the coming um, two Coffee with the Curators, two talks that I think you'll all enjoy. Uh, Margot Hammond, who was on our staff for a period of time and has gone on to do private uh, projects, she's going to be talking about crosses and crucifix, crucifixes in art history, uh, culminating in Dolly's approach to this uh, biblical icon. That's going to be in December. And then in uh, January, Annette Norwood um, from our staff is going to be talking about Dolly and the concept of genius. So both of those should be a lot of fun. We certainly hope you'll be able to come back and join us for that. And now, let's move on to the talk at hand. So a while back, I put together this, uh, this concept. It's like, wouldn't it be great to talk about Dolly and Escher together and do some comparison? And as time went by, a lot of the things I had planned to do with this wound up on the audio guide. And then they wound up in Joan's talk last month. So I was left with a little bit of a, a kind of, do I do it all over again? Or what am I going to do with this? So what I put together was a very, is a very loose kind of a set of reflections on Dolly and Escher, uh, some of the problems associated with them, why we don't encounter them in museums, and um, just some uh, random uh, comparisons between the two of them. So uh, M.C. Escher, Maritz Cornelius Escher, was born in 1898 six years prior to Salvador Dali, and uh, passed away in 1972, so he lived a pretty long life. He is a Dutch artist who is a printmaker, so his whole world is about printmaking. It's uh, relatively different from Dali, who was an oil painter, plus a printmaker, plus a variety of other things. For Escher, it was all about uh, the printed graphic. And he's known for mathematically inspired woodcuts, lithographs, and mezzotints. So those are the three types of prints that he works in. Salvador Dali, um, of course, 
1904, so six years after that, just shortly after the, the millennium. Uh, died 1989, Spanish surrealist, but also nuclear mystical painter. Um, and he's known for Freudian-inspired images that have this kind of veristic uh, similitude, looking very naturalistic, but depicting images of the dreams and fantasy. So what is the paradox? <clears throat> we have two artists who everybody in this room has seen before. Everybody in this room had seen these artists before you ever walked into this museum. And yet, if you try to seek out Dali's paintings and, and major collections, there's not a lot of them there. They are out there. There are some museums like MoMA, or the Menil, or, um, or Philadelphia Museum that have a couple great Dali's. But Dali's are primarily not parts of many of the major uh, museum collections. If you go to seek out Escher in museums, you are almost always going to be thwarted because although some museums do have collections of Escher prints, they are not really part of the primary way that we, uh, we encounter him. So how do we encounter Dolly and Escher before we have this museum experience? Um, many of you are probably familiar with an image like this, either from your past or from your children's past. But here we have a typical dorm room. And I don't know if you can see it, but right up here we have the persistence of memory right next to Sylvester Stallone and Bob Marley. Uh, kind of appropriate. And uh, in this room, which is another bedroom image, this is from Donnie Darko, but they chose the Escher Eye as one of the images that's part of his room. We, we live with these images rather than going to museums to see these images. Even more close to home, tattoos. There are so many Dolly and Escher tattoos, it's astounding. You just go online, type either one in Google, and uh, it's just this plethora, this eruption of images that people have chosen to embody, you know, to put on their, their flesh. And the amazing thing is that you, know, you will not find, say, really many Warhols. You won't find many Picassos. You won't find Duchamp, really, not much. You will find lots and lots of Dolly and Escher on prints on tattoos, and of course, t-shirts, you know. We see a lot of t-shirts out there, but uh, these two in particular seem very, very um, fond for us. Um, you know, it's this idea that we encounter these artists through culture rather than through the museum experience. They have been sort of assimilated into a much broader understanding of the types of things that we encounter in our everyday life. So how is, let's look at both of them. How is Dali presented in major museums and then how is Escher presented in major museums? Well, the first thing to be said is that there are a lot of great, great Dali's in wonderful museums everywhere. But the one that we always go back to as kind of the example to show how Dali is not always treated like uh, his colleagues is The Last Supper, which is of course owned by the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I'm sure many of you have seen this photo before. I've shown it many times, but this is our former colleague, um, Mitzi Gordon, and she is having some water by the bathrooms at the National Gallery. This is where this painting by Dolly is hung, you know, The Last Supper. It's one of Dolly's best known works. It's really one of his pivotal religious pieces from the nuclear mystical period. It has been moved around so many times in the National Gallery. For a long time, it was on a stairwell between two floors. Someone complained about it not being able to get close to it in a wheelchair, so it was moved down to basically the basement where you walk between the two wings. And uh, you know, it's not exactly a place of prestige, and uh, you know, really kind of cuts, comes home very well. So a lot of the way we understand Dali is through the two museums. You know, there's our museum and there's the museum in uh, Figueres, Spain, Dali's own museum. These are primary institutions that also encourage exhibitions to go elsewhere. And unlike a lot of other artists, there are a lot of Dolly galleries. Probably if you've done any traveling in the last five years, you've at least encountered one of these in some European community, um, you know, here or abroad. But a space Montmartre is certainly a place where everybody has stories of having just stumbled upon it. There's a, a Dolly gallery in Bruges. There was one um, under the Millennium Eye for a long time. They just pop up wherever, almost like mushrooms. You know, it's just Dolly's influence and enthusiasm for Dolly is everywhere, but not necessarily in the museum environment. So why is this? Why is it that Dolly, you know, is not seen quite as uh, readily as some of his colleagues in museums? Well, it's, it's, there's a legacy here. Dolly is a very unique and unusual figure in the 20th century. A lot of people, appropriately so, accuse him of being garish, of being distasteful, of being insincere, 
You know, this is sort of the standard line on Dolly, is that he is someone you can't take seriously. He's always um, you know, a charlatan. Even if he's a great craftsman, he's you know, somewhat glib in his image making. You know, these are all accusations that uh, have some, some relevance on some level with uh, each period of his career. And yet they are fantastic images that we respond to as well. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a mixed um, uh, assimilation of Dali or understanding of Dali, that the art world itself, the, the arbitrators of taste and of value find Dali to be a bit um, uncouth and perhaps not to be seen in public circles. Also, Dolly was loved by the counterculture, and that's usually a very bad thing. <laughs> there, is a, there is a certain taint or a certain you know, misfortune that follows you if you are very, um, very much loved by the counterculture. And of course, Dolly didn't take the art world very seriously. Perhaps his greatest sin in life is uh, the amount of time that he spent you know, um, uh, lampooning the world of fine art. And I think that that is the way that, uh, that many of us love Dolly, have come to learn of Dolly, really enjoy Dolly, and yet it's also why Dolly was a very inappropriate person to be collecting in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so let's look at Escher. You know, how is Escher presented in major museums? Well, we can go back in time and we can find that in the 1930s already, Escher was starting to find, um, find a place in major institutions. So for example, in 1930, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam had a relationship with him. Their print uh, collection acquired 26 images. That's a lot of images to acquire very quickly. It's one of the most important institutions in Europe of print collecting, and his work was collected you know, uh, thereafter very um, constantly. A little closer to home here in the United States, in 1934, Escher uh, had a piece shown in, the, um, in a competition at the Art Institute of Chicago. It did not win first prize. I think it was third prize, but uh, it was actually purchased by the Art Institute. And so his work was starting to be recognized internationally, was collected, but certainly not on the degree of which you normally associate with a, with a printmaker. And as a result, um, you know, not seen very often. One of the other paradoxes, going back to the National Gallery, they have one of the largest collections of any institution. And yet still, if you were to visit there, you would rarely get to see Escher. You know, it's just prints are often not shown as your first, uh, you know, your first level of introduction to a museum's collection. And then often they're brought out for special occasions. So um, even though they have a lot of work, you probably wouldn't have a chance to see it there. So how is Escher seen? How is it that we've come to you know, really experience him in a museum um, environment? It's primarily through exhibitions, traveling exhibitions. And the show upstairs that we have is one of several exhibitions that are currently traveling. This is another collection of Escher pieces that was shown in Alberta, Canada at the, um, let's see, the Glenbow Museum. And these are incredibly popular exhibitions. If you talk to any museum person or docent who's been involved in one of these shows, the public absolutely loves them. And in many ways, I think you could argue that this is really changing the tide, that we're all starting to understand Escher a little more better than we did 10 years ago. And it's, uh, it primarily is because of the, the popularity of such um, exhibitions. And also, almost like Dali, Escher has, uh, has been blessed with institutions that want to show Escher collections. So for example, the Heracliden, which owns the collection we have upstairs, Paul Firos established that four years ago with a, a friend of his in order to find a place, a home for, uh, for these Escher pieces. And they found that uh, it actually makes more sense to travel the show than to keep it there. So they have some other pieces. They have a great Toulouse-Lautrec collection and I believe um, an Anaskiewicz collection, but the Escher travels. And so we benefit from that experience. Uh, there's also an Escher collection, I believe, in not Amsterdam, but um, oh, elsewhere in the Netherlands. There is an actual museum of Escher. And so it's the fact that you know, if, museum, if major museums aren't showing them, other institutions are trying to basically celebrate these two artists. So why is Escher sort of outside of the fold? Well, first off, one very interesting observation, which uh, I think really does help to understand the difference between Escher and Dali. Escher was primarily a loner, and he was skilled in the tradition of graphic design and graphic arts. He was not part of the sort of art community that Dali benefited from. You know, Dali, very, at a very young age, goes, he meets Picasso. Very quickly, he's introduced to Andre Breton through Juan Miro. He's associated his entire career with the names that matter in 20th century art. 
He is a, a fine artist. Escher is a printmaker and a craftsman. He was very much a loner, very independent. He did not rub elbows with, uh, with Picasso, nor did he smooch uh, on the Warhol. You know, it's <laughs> not part of his world. And so, you know, there's a very different expectation for how his work is to be seen and to be understood in relation to fine art. Um, also, his first major audience was not art connoisseurs, it was mathematicians. And so in the mid-1950s, he had a major show in Amsterdam, which coincided with an international mathematician conference. They saw his work, and immediately he, his reputation just you know, blossomed. Not to his liking, actually, that should be mentioned. He, he was very, very happy to suddenly be interacting with all these mathematicians who appreciated what he had accomplished, but he didn't like the newfound fame. So he was, unlike Dolly, not so comfortable in the spotlight. And, of course, there were a number of, uh, of magazines that published uh, articles about him, including Time and Life magazine. Not Art News, not Art Forum, not, you know, the more focused art community type of journals, but rather very popular um, uh, magazines. So he was quickly embraced by the public rather than by um, collectors within the art world. Also, just like Dali, he was loved by the counterculture. Again, kiss of death. Not a very good way to... Uh, to have your work collected by um, you know, the erudite or the connoisseurs in New York. Another observation about um, Escher that I think is really important to, to remember, or at least to, when you wonder why an image like this isn't seen at the National Gallery very often, part of it is because of how easily his work deals with and handles the images associated with science fiction. And for example, this great book by Italo Calvino, Cosmic Comics, used an Escher on the cover. And I think it's a very appropriate image because it captures the flavor of that particular uh, writing by Calvino. And I think Escher's work exists in relation to traditional art imagery in the way science fiction exists in relation to fine literature or to high literature. Um, no matter how good the work is, it's always seen and relegated to a subgenre. It's never seen as equal to the best writing or the best art making, regardless of the quality of it. It's just the, the sheer way of approaching the subject puts it in a different category that's not quite as respected, that seems a little bit more of an um, esoteric type of interest. And there's finally just the observation that prints are seen as something quite different than oil paintings. And so there's a tradition in Europe in particular of incredible fine craftsmen working in the print tradition that are collected in and of themselves, but that don't wind up in museums. You know, so there's this incredible legacy through the 20th century, but going all the way back to people like Albrecht Dürer. Of course, Dürer is everywhere in all the major museums, but at some point, those traditions have, uh, you know, bifurcated. And people like Escher wind up being collected by people who appreciate prints, but not necessarily seen in the same way within the uh, fine art world. So let's take a moment and just examine some of the prints that Escher was doing, and then a little bit of um, uh, examination of a few pieces by Dali in the world of printmaking. First thing that really, um, I think, fascinated all of us, and hopefully we'll be able to ask uh, Paul Firo some uh, questions about this, but Escher is not only a loner in the world of interacting with fine art, he was also a loner in the way that he produced his images. And this is very unusual. He, it is said, and our director perhaps rightly started to question this, but it's said that he had no apprentice. There was nobody assisting him with any of his printmaking, which is a pretty unusual situation. Most printmakers will have somebody at an atelier assisting them with transferring the images, or at least you know, trying to complete a lot, of, uh, a lot of work. Also, he never had a publisher, which is even more astounding, given the way that the fine art world really relies on sales. You know, it relies on an artist being represented by a gallery or a dealer. And it seems like Escher sold his own prints. And again, this is a question that we need to put to the collector, but certainly from the biographies, it seems that he was um, basically probably went to print, sh print shows, you know, set up a tent, and was selling his work that way. So it was much more of a kind of fine craft rather than art market approach to selling his work. And, you know, just to remind ourselves some of the ideas that he works on that move him into this realm of science fiction, he works on concepts of duality, uh, relativity, um, impossible realities, um, infinity using mirroring and inverted surfaces, 
He's the artist associated with tessellations and polyhedra, you know, going back to the geometry that appealed to Leonardo da Vinci, that became a huge part of his world. He's also known for creating visual paradoxes involving the mirrors, multiple dimensions, and uh, infinity and impossible constructions. These are terms that are never used with Picasso. They're never used with Moreau. You know, they are very specific to the world that Escher created for himself. Um, some of his very earliest work, and we have a couple examples upstairs, show his gift of design and also caricature. He was very comfortable working in this realm. St. Francis preaching to the birds is just incredibly charming, and it was really one of his finest pieces to sell early on. And then he, this did not repeat itself for a couple more decades, but he sold these pieces very well. But by the time you get to 1932, and he's living in Italy, and he becomes more fascinated by the morbid and the strange, uh, he starts works like uh, Mummified Priests in Ganji, which is one of the um, really fascinating points in the, the exhibition. People spend a lot of time looking at these works. And then in 1937, he had this breakthrough, where he went from being an artist who was basically a landscape uh, you know, printmaker, that was his primary subject, to suddenly creating these impossible worlds completely turning the world on its ear. So for example, Still Life and Street from 1937, we have what looks like a traditional image and it looks very uh, believable. Looks like the, and a, um, a realistic depiction of some buildings in the background, a street with some children playing, and then some objects collected right in front of us on a table or a balcony until you realize that there's no demarcation between foreground and background. This area right here, it's like he pulled uh, you know, the rope out or the the cloth out from under us and suddenly the table is the street in the background. There's no difference. There's no point where the table ends and the street begins. And when he did this work, he suddenly had this epiphany that this is what interested him. These kind of conundrums, these paradoxes, that was where he wanted to develop his work. And of course, shortly after that, when he had an opportunity to visit the Alhambra for the second time, he had another revelation that the mathematical precision of the Alhambra as created um, by the Moors was something that completely and totally captivated him, but he wanted to flesh it out with actual uh, illusionistic imagery. And so the most grand statement of these tessellations is his metamorphosis piece, which is over 13 feet long, done as three prints that were you know, seamlessly uh, woven together. And you start from the crossword puzzle with metamorphosis, leading into a checkerboard, into, which transforms into these um, um, tessellated reptiles. And by the way, in case you're not aware, the, the word tessellation is a mathematical term referring to a plane surface, like a two-dimensional surface, covered completely and totally by a repeated uh, image. So there's no overlap and there's no gaps left. So it's, it's like tiling, creating a tiled uh, surface. And that's what, what we have here in this uh, pattern. So we go into the reptiles that transforms into these wasps that are dissolving into the fish. And you keep going and then the fish become birds which become this uh, small Italian community which goes into the chessboard, back to the checkerboard. And you wind up where you began with this kind of infinite uh, loop going back to the, uh, the crossword puzzle. Fascinating, amazing things. Not understood by many in 1939. There was only a few people that really thought this was exciting, but it's what led to his, him being recognized by us at this point as being one of the great printmakers. This is a, a really fascinating object for a, a number of reasons. It's perhaps one of the most charming pieces he created. It's called Reptiles. And he takes one of his tessellated two-dimensional patterns and basically his way of explaining it is that one of these reptiles got fed up with living in the two-dimensional world, <laughs> heaved himself out of it, does a little walk, blows off a little steam, and then just dissolves right back into the, uh, the pattern. Um, what's, what's been fascinating to us as we've kind of known more about the story of, uh, of Escher is that this was done right at the height of World War II. It's 1943, he's living in the Netherlands and it's an occupied territory. The Nazis have completely taken over the Netherlands and the lowlands. They have built airports. Uh, it's a period of duress. You know, and what was also stated is that over this period of time, 75% of the, the Jewish community is basically taken away and disappears. So it's, it's a time of, of great struggle and great strife, and yet he finds an opportunity to let his imagination wander in a surprisingly whimsical area. But it's a beautiful piece. And then by 1946, um, 
the story goes, or at least one of the stories associated with this very haunting image, is that uh, his very closest friend and mentor, a man named De Mesquita, Jessup De Mesquita, um, was one of the Jewish uh, people that was rounded up and disappeared, went to Auschwitz. His entire family uh, was killed. And Escher discovers this. He was one of the first people to discover that he's missing. He goes, he collects his images, and it seems like the ramifications of losing such an important friend in such a horrifying way more or less culminate after the, about a year after the war in this particular image, this really haunting image of a self-portrait, which is actually a skull reflected in the pupil. So a very powerful piece. And again, it's the piece that's in Donnie Darko in his bedroom. So there's, there's that. <laughs> And then the last image just to show you is that, uh, you know, really the culmination of, uh, of his vision wound up being these in impossible buildings, these just really wonderful, strange, bizarre, mathematically conceived structures which visually look completely normal, and yet when you start to examine what it is that it's being presented, you realize it's completely impossible. And for example, with this water wheel piece, which is probably dedicated to his father, who was a hydraulics engineer, we have basically a kind of perpetual motion machine where water is allowed to flow upstream. So the water keeps feeding the wheel that keeps turning. Completely impossible, and yet when you look at it, you don't realize what's wrong until you see what was inspired by the mathematicians. These triangles here look deceptively correct, and yet are completely, you know, they're, they're deceptive. In a two-dimensional surface, they seem correct. If you try to build them in a three-dimensional world, they're impossible. And so this was really where he was able to um, connect with mathematicians. So let's briefly look at a couple really fun examples of Dali's printmaking, uh, just as a comparison and contrast. Um, and before we look at those, just a quick comment. Dali was an oil painter. That's what his training was in. He was a great draftsman as well. He was not a printmaker. He did a lot of work involving prints. He became known throughout the world for the multitude of prints he produced. Most of them were gouache, oil paint, or work that was done on some level with stone, but often with the assistance of, uh, of you know, people in the ateliers. So Dali was always working with an atelier, always working with assistants when he produced prints, and he had publishers who were arranging for these uh, commissions. So Dali never went into, um, you know, had a, uh, a block that he just started to draw on for his own pleasure. There was almost always a buyer waiting for it. So for him, printmaking was a way of becoming very affluent and getting your work out there very quickly for the masses. It was a very quick and easy solution, and his approach to printmaking was very different than his approach to oil painting, which was very labor-intensive and uh, you know, detailed. Perhaps one of the great, great moments in Dali's printmaking is right at the very beginning when he does the La Chance de Madurur, and he does a few pieces related to that, like the grasshopper child here which are just incredibly exquisite and very close to the kind of um, amazing drawings that Dolly was working on. These are also pretty unusual because shortly after this, Dolly develops a very different approach to printmaking. This is just way too labor intensive for what he was trying to accomplish. So this is perhaps a little more typical of Dolly's prints. It's a very well known image and the reason it's well known is because it was part of the Vincent Price collection offered through Sears Roebuck. You know? <laughs> You never found an Escher offered through Sears Roebuck. <laughs> but for Dali, this was a way, you know, you get, get it out to the masses. And this is the way you also bypass the fine art circles, is you get it into the hands of people everywhere. Almost in the same way that Dali was obsessed by the painting The Angelus, which also became known, you know, everywhere, because it was just such a popular um, image that was everywhere. It was always available. One of the more interesting um, examples of Dolly's approach to printmaking is he would get bored with the process, and in the mid, late 50s, I think it was 1958 to 59, he was approached by an interesting publisher named Joseph Foray, who wanted him to be involved in this project called The Apocalypse. It was to be the heaviest, largest book ever created. It was to have eight different artists associated with it doing uh, some images for it. And Dolly not only did the cover of the book, but he also did this really interesting piece. Um, this is actually one of the images we have in our collection. It's a print called Pieta, but it's an early stage of the more finished piece that wound up in the book. And when you look at it, this looks pretty abstract. Probably what you see is a series of patterns, almost like watching a static on the TV. But the longer you look at it, you'll start to see what look definitely like um, uh, nails, you know, somehow accumulated over the space, strange little crosshatched lines. 
And if you look long enough, you'll start to notice that there's a face up here. Let's see. Yeah, right here. And you'll see shoulders. You'll see the body collapsing. Here's the knees and the legs. What he did, and I'll come back to this image in just a second, but what he did is he created a grenade. And this is a grenade that was filled with nails. And Dolly created four plates, four copper plates, put them together in a box, detonated the grenade. The grenade exploded. It left this incredible random pattern of nail uh, passages in the copper plates. And then he went back to it and using his visionary capacity started to recognize form and shape. And he etched parts of it out so that you start to see the, the body of Christ. And it's, it's subtle, but it's definitely there. And that's basically the way that Dolly felt most comfortable operating, was going from chaos to create some sort of level of order. And what's really remarkable is that when you see the finished piece, you can see how our piece is incorporated in a much more ambitious image right here, which is basically the Madonna holding the body of Christ on her lap. And that's why he has this kind of compressed, folded form, is because he is, it's a pieta. You know, it's the, the dead body of Christ held by uh, the Madonna. And this is Dolly actually working on this later version of it by his house in Port Legat. And this is Dolly with Joseph Foré around that time doing all the plans for it. And then one last just example of Dolly's approach to printmaking that's pretty fun. Uh, this is a piece called The Triumph of the Sea. Battle, struggle between these uh, man and beast, basically, all these octopi that are uh, you know, engaged in a kind of a, I guess, a, a prelude to the Japanese obsession with uh, tentacles and, and octopi and that type of thing. But what's really fun about this, Dolly actually used a real octopus in order to create the octopus tentacle pattern that's in here. So this is something where you know, he's open to all materials that are available to him to basically create something different and new. So he would often have a lot of fun with printmaking. It's certainly a much more loose approach to image creation than his oil paintings, and very popular. You know, so people really uh, love these. But it also shows you the kind of inventive nature that Dolly had. But certainly, Dolly was never the labor-intensive perfectionist that Escher was. You know, they are very different that way. So let me now progress into a related topic, which is, you know, what are a couple of the common themes between Escher and Dolly, both artists of the fantastic, and how do they handle similar material? And perhaps the first one is to talk about this idea of, um, you know, the dream or an image of the, the impossible. On the left-hand side, we have Escher's very famous image called uh, Stairs. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, Dolly's slave market with the disappearing bust of Voltaire. And perhaps the first thing to state is that for Escher, he approaches these, um, these concepts almost as abstract ideas. It's like he's illustrating the paradox for a journal. There's something about it that's very precise, but also very impersonal. For Dolly, it's always motivated by, motivated by something very personal, something uniquely that he's experienced, something that gives you the sense of Dolly's world erupting onto the canvas. So on the left-hand side, all of these stairways are presented simultaneously, and you start realizing that there's three different um, gravity sources. So there's three different realities that have been overlaid on one another, and each person, depending on which reality they're in, are unaware of the person in the other reality. So there's all these stairways, but you'll see people are walking at different angles. They're not aware of each other. And his suggestion here is that there are multiple realities that look the same, but that are, um, are not the same. Dolly's work on the right, very, very different. It's the idea that perhaps the world is always in flux, metamorphosizing. He's looking at the image of, uh, of um, the bust of Voltaire, and he immediately has this hallucinatory experience of seeing what looks like figures standing in an opening, an archway. And that's the illusion that he creates. And so it becomes very personal, very much motivated by a particular experience he has. And then he uses this to illustrate this idea that Voltaire represents skepticism, Dolly represents surrealism or the irrational. And so he uses his wife, Gala, to basically dispel the threat, the kind of slavery to the mundane represented by Voltaire. So really personal, kind of quirky, very, um, very unique to Dolly, where Escher feels much more um, abstracted and an idea more than a particular um, set of uh, impulses. Here's the way both of them approach the, um, 
uh, in very early state on both of their careers, but they approach the supernatural. We have this wonderful piece, which is part of a series called um, The Adventures of Scholastica. These were illustrations by Escher for a friend of his, a uh, supernatural story about a witch. And this is just, you know, they're a lot of fun. They definitely um, repay repeated uh, uh, looking to see the kind of caricatures that he created. On the right-hand side, Dali also interested in this kind of early approach to, um, uh, to witches and the supernatural. But here, Dali has actually made it personal because he's placed them in the community of Kadikas, something that he's very uh, fond of, very uh, inspired by. And so for Dali, the witches become associated with his own homeland, where for Escher, they become an illustration for a story for children or for young adults. And then finally, just a, I wanted to show you this one uh, because it's been commented on by a lot of our docents. <laughs> Dolly, of course, has this obsession with, uh, with praying mantises. So it was just fascinating for all of us to see this Escher piece that also focused on a praying mantis. And Escher said that he was basically doing some sketches of a sarcophagus of a, of a bishop. And while he was working on the sketches, he saw a, a praying mantis off to the side, so he started to sketch that. And then in a later version, he brings the two together and he calls it a dream. And when you see this, you definitely have that kind of uncanny sense of terror. The, the praying mantis seems far larger than it would normally appear naturally, so it seems monstrous. You have not just a person asleep, but you actually have this bishop who we know was based on a sarcophagus, and so he seems like he's lost the time. And then we see this, the, um, uh, the roof of this area that we assume to be the crypt of a, ch of a church is actually the stars. So it's very cosmic, it's very threatening, it's very supernatural, but it's not very personal. You know, this is not motivated by a particular horrible vision that he had. This is motivated by this fascination with, uh, you know, something that haunts or could scare us. For Dali, it's very personal and very strange. You know, Dali, at some point, talks in his own autobiography about his fear of grasshoppers, his fear of praying mantises, and then he takes that in his surrealist years and turns that into this very, very bizarre um, approach to a painting by Jean-Francois Millet. This is our painting, The Archaeological Reminiscence of Millet's Angelus. The female figure from Millet's painting has taken on the pose of a praying mantis. And for Dali, the obsession is with uh, the fear of sex, the fear of um, any kind of intimacy, and the threat that the female will be like a vampire or a succubus and will cannibalize the male once they actually have sex. That's pretty unique. That is not a concept shared by many people. It's part of why we love Dolly. It's part of why Dolly is not really as appreciated in the fine art circles as some of his colleagues. But it's, uh, it's totally fascinating. Here you can see the transformation between uh, the female Angelus from um, Malay's painting and then how Dolly connects it with the praying mantis. And I just added one more image, which I found of uh, another one of these terrifying, horrible praying mantis creatures in Dolly's work. But eventually, the male dies. You know, that's, that's the point. <laughs> so again, very personal. So I did find a couple images just to add to this that, um, that also I thought were, were pretty fascinating, which is the question, you know, was Dolly aware of Escher? Was Escher aware of Dolly? Because certainly, as I said, Escher wasn't working in the kind of circles that Dolly would have been um, you know, going in. So did they ever encounter each other or talk about each other? Well, um, our librarian, Shana, was, was very kind to have done a little bit of research. And she found this photograph in a book of Dolly's house. And this is basically um, what you're looking at is a styrofoam shape, which was kind of the packing material used for a radio that Dolly had bought from, uh, from Japan. And yet, if you, if you recognize it, it's because Dolly used this, this imprint to create the, uh, uh, the grotto by his pool. So this became this large structure, which is the grotto. And what you can see right in front of it very clearly, Dolly had this Escher book that he probably used as a source of inspiration, or at least to look and kind of think about what Escher was dealing with. So Dolly, very aware of Escher. Which brings us to this fabulous piece, Day and Night, from 1938. This is a, one of Escher's best, best examples of a tessellation, and it's also a best example of symmetry. Because what you have is when you dissect the canvas, or dissect the print, left-hand side is going to be daytime, right-hand side is nighttime. It's a perfect mirror image. You see the same river twice, but in reflection. The same community, little village, is uh, reflected daytime and nighttime, left and right. And then what he's done, which is amazing and miraculous, is he's taken the ground, which has this beautiful kind of 
tiled um, uh, quality to it, the sort of abstract patterning of the different fields, and he metamorphosizes them, he transforms them to suddenly they well up to become white and black birds, which are interlocked, flowing in each direction. So for the white birds, the black birds become the negative space, which is nighttime. For the black birds, the white birds become the white space of daytime in the background. So it's this amazing ability to think about this and then find a way to bring it forward so we can see it. Dali appreciated this piece. And in his painting from 1967, Tuna Fishing, which is in a private collection, Paul Ricard's collection um, on the Isle of Man, I believe. The only time it's ever been shown publicly was in the, um, I think it was the 2009 exhibition in Paris at the uh, Pompidou. Maybe it's even more recent than that, 2012, 2013. But um, in the background, you know, this is basically sort of like what we saw earlier with the image of the octop octopus and the figures battling. Here we have tuna and figures battling. And yet when you look into the background, right at the very top, you can see it on the right-hand side, there's a woman who looks very much like Gala, seemingly stepping out of a pool or a tub. And right next to her on the right-hand side over here, Dolly quotes Escher. He puts in the tessellation. You know, so not only was he aware of Escher, he really responded to Escher, and he makes sure he includes and tips his hat to Escher in this particular painting. So it's a pretty wonderful moment. It's a shame we couldn't get this painting to put in the exhibition, but you know, you can't have everything. And just, uh, just if, you, if you're not aware of this painting, this was the, the large canvas Dolly worked on the summer before working on the Toreador. So this is also about 12 feet long. It's huge. So this, you know, you can definitely see the Escher when you look at the original. And two more images that just were, you know, occurred to us. I don't think there's any science or a real, um, you know, process of trying to look far, but it occurred to, to a couple of us that Escher's piece called Convex Concave, which deals with the idea that a box, when you paint it with shading, can appear to be both coming out and receding in simultaneously. It's the idea of the Necker cube deals with a visual psychology, and that's what Escher is developing here, where the same shape on both sides seems to either be receding into the, the um, background or popping out into the foreground. And you can see it really well with this square here and then this square here, where it's exactly the same shape, and yet it seems to flip backwards on the right and flip forwards on the left. And the whole print is nothing but a study of this back and forth, popping out, popping in. On the right-hand side is Dali's image of uh, the skull of Zerberon, so a tribute to one of his favorite Spanish uh, painters from uh, the, the Renaissance in the bro uh, early Baroque period, early Baroque. And yet when you look at it, what he's done also is exactly what Escher's done. He's created the skull out of these Necker cubes, out of these boxes. And the longer you look at them, you'll start to notice that the eyes appear to either collapse inwards or they pop out. And he's doing exactly the same thing Escher's doing. He's having fun with this illusion that we can't decide which is coming forward and which is going back. And they were done within a year of each other. So the question comes up, is this Dolly responding to this Escher print, or is this just a coincidence? And we don't know. Similar, although a little bit different from the opposite side, one of everybody's favorite piece upstairs, one of them is Bond of Union, which is this uh, study of Escher and his wife, uh, Jetta sort of as attached in this one band bandage which wraps around both of them and yet is one bandage. And yet they seem sadly sort of adrift amongst all these planetary forms. And so you have the, the bandage and then you also have all of these different spheres that are floating around them like bubbles. It took about 60 studies before he finally committed this final piece, um, you know, completed. Uh, so he spent a lot of time preparing and thinking about what he wanted it to look like. When we look at the work on the right by Dali, a beautiful painting from his uh, nuclear mystical period called Galatia the Spheres, this is really similar. You know, when we look at it, the way Dali has handled all of these spheres looks a whole lot like the way Escher handles the spheres in Bond of Union. The ultimate conclusion is a little bit different. You know, he uses the bands to create the face, Dali uses the spheres, but they really do seem to resemble one another. And here, Escher's doing his after Dali has done his. Is it inspired? You know, who knows? Um, Escher certainly never commented on it. We don't have anything in the biography, but uh, it's a good question to put to Paul Firos when he visits. So, just kind of as a last, uh, last series of thoughts, 
Who are some of the other artists that have been difficult for museum, the museum community, who over time have become more welcomed into the traditional fine art world? Uh, Norman Rockwell, you know, probably the best example of all. There is, of course, the Norman Rockwell Museum now in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, there was an exhibition recently at the Museum of Fine Arts. Here, this traveling show has really changed the thoughts of a lot of people about Rockwell. The important thing to note about Rockwell, which makes him very unique and very much a different sort of problem, he was never doing his work as a fine artist. He was always doing his work for a finished uh, project. There was always an image for the newspaper that needed to be created. And that is a very, very different kind of world than the world we're talking about with Dali or with Escher, who are really fine artists kind of working towards their own vision and then hoping someone eventually will take interest. But definitely some similarities. Um, and Rockwell now being more or less established as a recognized important part of the 20th century through museums and exhibitions. Andy Warhol. You know, I think it's hard to think of 20th century art without immediately thinking of Warhol as being front and center to what 20th century art is all about. And yet, clearly, that has not always been the case. You know, in the late 60s and early 70s, Warhol, well, early 60s to the mid 60s, Warhol just was the biggest pain in everybody's side. More people tried to get rid of Warhol and not think about Warhol, but it was because he was part of the art world to begin with. He went to the right schools, he had the right friends, he knew the right collectors. They recognized what he was starting to work with and starting to, to um, make fun of, to lampoon, to turn on its ear. And because of his connections in those worlds, they became sort of the wave that allowed him to have museum shows so quickly. And it's very important. I mean, he was the challenge from the next generation against the abstract expressionists. So it really was a generational uh, shock that was happening with Warhol. And of course, Warhol, deeply inspired by Dali. The idea about how you live your life, how you become rich, how you surround yourself by an entourage, all these kind of extraneous things that are not um, pleasing to the art community were adopted immediately by Warhol. And yet he quickly turned it into a way to become part of the art establishment. Going a little bit further, Judy Chicago. Very, very different set of uh, circumstances, but uh, the dinner party, which I think everybody here is aware of, becomes this really this first sort of, um, I guess, sledgehammer that was thrown into this whole machine of the canon of male artists and how you get um, issues associated with feminism to be discussed in the fine art world. And there was so much resistance to this. It was absolutely incredible. Museums were disgusted by collectors, um, um, board of trustees, didn't want anything to do with it, and yet she started to travel this, and it was seen by thousands and thousands of people every time it went to a new museum, to where now, even though it's not part of the uh, permanent collection, it is in the Sackler Center for Feminist Art in Brooklyn Museum of Art. It is a major core piece, and it's part of the history of how feminism and feminist uh, issues changed the, uh, the art world. Very, very different type of uh, question. The question of naive art, and where does that fit with traditional fine art? Um, Howard Finster, the Reverend Howard Finster, his work um, seems like it has no place in the world of fine art, and yet at the High Museum in Atlanta, there is an entire wing devoted to Reverend Finster's work, and it's fabulous, and people collect it, and they look to it for the visionary capacity of the untrained eye. And it's really changed, again, how we interpret art and how we see art. So. Who would have thought, you know, in, in 1920, 1940, that work that looked like this would be part of our way of, um, you know, collecting and talking about the, the art experience. And of course, <laughs> gotta, gotta include Jeff Koons, you know. There were so many opportunities for who to choose, you know, Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, but uh, the yellow balloon dog just seems so lovely. And the Robert Hughes quote, which seems to be the statement of the art community about him is so perfect. He says, if cheap cookie jars could become treasures in the 1980s, then how much more work the very egregious um, Jeff Koons, a former bond trader whose ambitious, um, ambitions took him right through kitsch and out to the other side into a vulgarity so syrupy, gross, and numbing that collectors felt challenged by it. You know? and, and I've got to say, that quote, although very extreme, is not so far away from quotes that were made about Dali as well. You know, I think that this is sort of, he also, just like Warhol, was inspired by Dali, and that became sort of part of his strategy. 
So the art world really is kind of being shaken up very radically in the last 20 to 30 years. And uh, Jeff Koons is just one of the many uh, you know, moments of that. But you know, based on the most recent exhibition at, uh, I believe it was, um, was it the Whitney or at the Metropolitan? I think the Metropolitan. Yeah, this massive exhibition of Jeff Koons' work. You know, his work is some of the highest selling artwork uh, by anybody, period. So it's just, it's this really strange world that we're living in that what seemed completely impossible, you know, 10 years ago is suddenly the tradition today. So very, very un, you know, unfar-reaching conclusion, but, uh, you know, just going back to Dolly's favorite artist, Jan Vermeer, for two centuries, Jan Vermeer was unknown, uncollected, People were not interested in Vermeer. It wasn't until 1860 that he was, you know, rediscovered and suddenly has become one of the most important artists ever, you know, cherished by everybody, including Dali. But for 200 years, nobody talked about Vermeer. Vermeer did not exist. And, you know, Dutch Baroque art was also not part of, uh, you know, what was being collected. So it's pretty interesting how taste can change. And the very final slide I have, you know, the Impressionists. My God, you know, we don't have to go very far to realize that here was a group of people that was despised by the art community, hated, vilified. Um, it was really through some very quirky collectors that started to develop a passion for it, possibly also connected with, you know, friendships that developed between collectors and artists that led to Impressionism suddenly becoming perhaps the most fond and well-loved of all art movements, you know, over the past 200 years. It's the the art movement that everybody wants to have in their museum. And that wasn't the case, you know, even just 150 years ago. So the point being, through things like the exhibition that we have upstairs of Escher, through these traveling opportunities, through re-examinations of artists like Escher and Dali, you know, their interpretation and their place in the art world really does change over time. And we've certainly seen that with Dali going from being probably in the 70s and 80s, an artist that no museum wanted to acquire the work of because it would be a burden, you know, they did not want that responsibility, to now museums, you know, some of the biggest museums in the world, just vying for the opportunity to show a major Dali show because they know it will be so incredibly popular. And with that, um, I thank you all for coming this morning.